Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight, I'm continuing in the study of the book of John. And tonight, I'll be beginning with chapter 6, verse 1. If you have not seen the previous studies uh, on this subject, this book, uh, I hope you will go back to my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher, and look it up and, and watch this from the beginning. Uh, all right, then, let me get started. I'm, I'm a KJV firstist, so I will read it first in the KJV, and then, if necessary, I'll look at it in the Amplified if I think it may be helpful. <clears throat> After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. Well, it says a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. I guess that begs the question uh, about him performing the miracles. Um, there are four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, some of the miraculous things that Jesus did are recorded in one of the gospel accounts or two of them, but not necessarily in all of them. Each gospel account is an account according to the, uh, um, the, each of the individuals. Matthew was a, an apostle who was there observing Jesus during this time. Uh, Mark was uh, it's believed that Mark wrote his account uh, based upon the teachings of Peter. So many times the gospel of Mark is referred to Peter's gospel. So as Peter, an apostle, an eyewitness, he, he, uh, what he told Mark, Mark wrote down in that gospel account. Uh, Luke uh, is, uh, was not an apostle, but uh, he, investigated this. He says, I investigated, I've talked to everybody, I've interviewed everybody. He's known as a historian, in fact, a great historian. And he was also an associate of Paul for many years. So uh, he tells this gospel account according to all of the information that he received uh, from all of these witnesses. And then John, of course, uh, is referred to as the beloved apostle, the only one of the apostles that stuck with Jesus through everything, even his suffering and death on the cross. John stayed there while the others hid, hid for their lives. Um, but the point I'm making is that each one of these uh, people wrote these gospel accounts and they don't necessarily agree on everything. They're not really contradicting each other. They're just giving an account according to what they saw or what they were uh, told from eyewitnesses or and what the Holy Spirit directed them to give us. But the point I'm making is that there's many different miracles and signs and wonders that Jesus performed. Uh, and it says, this is the reason that all these people were following him. Uh, so on one hand, I believe Jesus had a sincere desire to heal the sick. Uh, he healed the lepers. He healed the lame, uh, the blind, the deaf. He raised Lazarus from the dead. He walked on water. He fed 5,000 with a few loaves of fishes and bread. And he, he fed 7,000 with a few fishes and loaves of bread. He did all these things because he wanted to help the people. He wanted to feed them. He wanted to heal them. He loved them. And yet he also had an ulterior motive. And that was the miracles were the signs to prove who he is. He claimed to be God. He claimed to be the son of God. The Jews wanted to stone him because of his claim of deity. They, he said, why, why do you want to stone me? He, he says, uh, no, it's, it's not just because you're working on the Sabbath. He performed miracles on the Sabbath. But also because 
you say God is your father, making yourself equal with God. So because he claimed to be God and the Jews understood his claim, they wanted to stone him. They considered that to be blasphemy. All of these things that he did were to support and prove that his claim of being God and Savior, that his claims were true. So you can see these people are following him because he performed the signs. And so the signs is kind of what kick-started his, uh, his ministry and gave him a great following because very quickly because of the miracles. So I'll read that again to emphasize it. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he, had, he did on them that were diseased. I'll read this in the Amplified now. It says, after this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee or Sea of Tiberias, a large crowd was following him because they had seen the signs attesting miracles, which he continually performed on those who were sick. And Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down there with his disciples. Uh, now the, the Passover, the Feast of the Jews, was approaching. Okay, so now we'll go on to verse 5 in the KJV. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. So the scriptures is kind of answering the question that everybody must be, be wondering. Uh, we know that Jesus is going to turn uh, the, the bread and the fishes into a large uh, uh, feast or a large amount of food to feed thousands. Uh, we all know about the story. And yet Jesus asked this question. Uh, he saith unto Philip, whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Uh, so you might wonder, well, why is he asking the question uh, if he knows he's going to uh, do isn't he omniscient? Isn't he God? Well, the scriptures tell us that he is uh, eternal God Almighty, that he is equal with the Father. Um, he is uh, uh, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. All those, he has all the characteristics and qualities of God, and yet he set aside the, some, of the, some of these things temporarily so he could also be a man. And uh, so he, in some ways, he was limited. But was he omniscient at this time? Did he know that he was going to perform this miracle? It says here in verse 6, And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Let me read that in the Amplified. It says, Jesus looked up and saw that a large crowd was coming toward him, and he said to Philip, Where will we buy bread for these people to eat? But he said this to test Philip, because he knew what he was about to do. <laughs> All right, now verse 7 in the KJV. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them. So in other words, they had enough money to buy 200 penny worth of bread, whatever that is, but it would be a small amount compared to what they would need. Uh, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. Uh, what is 200 penny worth? Let's see if it says in the Amplified. Philip answered, 200 denarii. That's 200 days wages. So that was quite a sum of money, 200 days wages. Uh, so that's like if you worked on your job for 200 days, which would be, if you're working five days a week, that's 40 weeks. That's uh, eight, nine. that's not like nine or 10 months of work. If you work nine or 10 months, the money that you ha would have is what they had to spend. And he said, 200 denarii worth of bread is not enough for each one to receive even a little. 
So now back to the KJV verse 8. It says, One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? Well, it makes us wonder. Uh, it is, he, he admitted, it, what is this among so many? And why, why bother even mentioning it? Well, maybe he was, uh, maybe he just decided to mention it because uh, um, he was aware of it. He wanted to bring it to their attention, even though it was pretty nominal and inconsequential to solve the problem. And yet, by mentioning it, you know, this gives uh, Jesus just what he needs to, to show, look, this is not enough, but I'll change it into plenty, more than enough. Uh, let me read that in, in the Amplified, verse 9. There is a little boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are these for so many people? In verse 10 in the KJV says, And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled and said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over, the, over and above unto them that had eaten. So he performed the miracle. Um, he had a small amount, and he miraculously changed it. He basically either caused these fishes and loaves to bread to be transported from some other location and be, be there, or he made them materialize out of thin air, kind of like we see in sci-fi movies like Star Trek, where they press a button and there's a plate, and then the, the molecules come together and there's a plate of food. Uh, there's a lot of things that we see in science fiction movies um, are kind of pictures of what Jesus actually did. Uh, for example, in the resurrection, he could change his appearance so that people, they, they're talking to him, they don't recognize him, and then he changes it and suddenly, they, oh, it's Jesus. So in a way, we could say Jesus is a shapeshifter. He was able to change his shape, change his appearance at will. Uh, also, you know how they, in Star Trek, they could beam you up or beam you from one location to another. Well, we know that Jesus, he was able to enter a room when the doors were closed and locked and he just appeared there among the, among the apostles. And, uh, uh, so how did he get, how did he get there? Did he just pass through the walls? Did he just materialize himself from one location to another? Is he able to like turn the press the transporter button and boom he's he's uh, relocated his molecules are disassembled and then moved and reassembled right in this into this room that's all locked up uh, so the things that that uh, people have faith in today i've always found this to be very interesting when we watch these sci-fi movies and they show you things that we're not capable of doing uh, and yet we we tend to believe that, well, that's eventually science will figure out how to do that, and these things will come in the, in the future. For example, the phone that they talked, the, the, I forgot what they called it on Star Trek, but they, they actually had it like a cell phone that they could talk on. And back then, of course, nobody even, uh, uh, we, of course, we didn't have the capability to do anything like that. Uh, I don't know if anybody even imagined about it, was even thinking about making something like that. But here, a few decades later, every, we all have our cell phones that are just like the phones they used on Star Trek. 
It's the same thing when they could transport someone from location, one location to the next. As we watch those, I remember watching those, uh, you know, decades ago. I, I, I had faith and, and most people had faith that someday science would figure it out and the people would be doing these things. We'll be doing space travel. We'll be doing uh, teleportations, things like these, because science would be capable of doing it. We had faith in science. And yet, oh, you have little faith. <laughs> you, you, some people are skeptical that Jesus Christ, the, the, the creator God Almighty, would, how could he possibly do the things that are recorded in the scriptures, these miraculous things? People tend to have faith in what science can do, these miraculous things, but they, they lack faith that, that God could do them. And there's a saying, well, you really think God could, these things are literal, like uh, Jonah's ark, I mean, uh, I mean uh, Noah's ark and Jonah in the, in the whale and the Garden of Eden, all these things are literal and uh, yeah, of course I do. Do you think that, do you really think God could like uh, have Jonah in the whale and then a lot of people think he was alive in the whale. Uh, but I, it's clear to me he was not alive. He swallowed by the whale. He was died inside the whale and then he was brought back to life. And the reason I know that is because Jesus used Jonah in the whale as an analogy saying that just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and so nights, uh, three nights, three days and three nights, so shall the son of man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. He re referenced Jonah in the whale as an analogous to him being dead, crucified, buried and then resurrected in three days. So uh, that's why I know Jonah was, was dead in the whale because Jesus was dead in the tomb. Um, but these things, uh, these things we read in the, in the Old Testament, all these miraculous things, uh, I believe they're all true. I, I hope you'll believe it too. Uh, but my, my question to everybody who doubts these miraculous things is the very first of the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. If you believe that's true, if you believe God created everything, <laughs> the universe, everything that's in it, all life, every, God created it, then that's a, that's a huge thing compared to just having Jonah in the whale or Noah and his ark, or separating the Red Sea so that Israelites could pass through, or shouting down a wall in Jericho. Uh, these miracles are nothing compared to God, in the beginning, God creating the heaven and the earth. So if you believe Genesis 1-1, it should be easy to believe all the rest of the miracles. Uh, I don't know if I got off tangent there for a moment. Let me see where we were. Um, oh yeah, the he uh, he had a few fishes, a few loaves. He fed uh, uh, five thousand, and then they gathered up the leftover food, and they filled twelve baskets full. Now, did you ever wonder why there were twelve baskets that were filled with leftovers? I, to me, it seems uh, pretty obvious that because there were 12 apostles tasked with helping him. So each, each apostle had a basket and he went to gather it up. Each one of those baskets were full. If, if Jesus had more apostles or more people were given baskets to fill up and say, go get the leftovers, their baskets would have been filled too. Now let me read this in the Amplified before we move on. Verse 10, uh, verse 11. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, the same also with the fish, as much as they wanted. When they had eaten enough, he said to his disciples, gather up the leftover pieces so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up 
and they filled 12 large baskets with pieces from the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Now, verse 14 in the KJV says, Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. Uh, those men, let me see if it says any idea who those men were, if these were just the, the crowd. I believe it was just the crowd. It says, Verse 14 in the Amplified says, when the people saw the sign attesting miracle that he had done, they began saying, this is without a doubt the promised prophet who is to come into the world. Okay, they're calling him a promised prophet. Other names for him. Uh, recorded in the Old Testament, uh, the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, uh, the promised one. Uh, all right, so back to the KJV, it says, verse 15, When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. And when even was now come, his disciples went down unto the sea, and it entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. Well, it, first of all, it says when Jesus perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king. Um, so many of the Jews thought that this promised one, this prophet, this Messiah, this Christ that was to come, is foretold in the Old Testament. Uh, over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament talking about this future one that would come. Jesus fulfilled all those prophecies in his coming. Uh, but the people thought he was coming to become their king and set up a kingdom, a literal king. They would, that he would kick, cause the Romans to leave, defeat them, or and, and then Israel would be an independent country and he would be their king, like King Saul, King David, King Solomon. And Jesus, Jesus knew that that's not why he came. And so he, he, he saw that they were going to actually try to like force this on him and declare him the king. And if that happened, all the plan, the plan of his real meaning of his coming, the real purpose of a coming, that he would die for our sins, be buried and raised from the dead, from the dead uh, so that we could all be saved, that, that plan had to play out properly. So he went and hid for fear that they might all declare him king and then other people would support him and then it would cause things to the plan to go awry. Let me read this in the Amplified. Verse 14, no, verse 15. Uh, then Jesus, knowing that they were going, that they were going to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountainside by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, and they got into a boat and started to cross the sea to Capernaum. It was already dark, and Jesus had not come back to them. Well, it doesn't tell us why. Maybe that there was already some agenda, plan, or a schedule to follow, and that's why the apostles went, did what they did. But Jesus wasn't were there. They, they were ex expecting him to be there. But they went ahead. Apparently, they were already told to do this. Uh, I, I don't think they'd be just acting on their own. Uh, and, and yet, Jesus wasn't with them. Why wasn't he with them? Well, we know that he went and hid so that they wouldn't declare him as a king, but maybe there's another reason. Uh, verse, verse 18. 
And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. So when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. <laughs> Verse 20, but he saith unto them, it is I, be not afraid. So, it, remember, there's a great wind. It says the, the sea arose by reason of a great wind. Now, there's a great wind, so the waves are violent, and it's big waves. And yet Jesus is walking on the water towards them. And if you saw that, not expecting to see it, I mean, you'd probably be shocked and amazed, but they were also afraid. And perhaps they thought that he was, they didn't recognize it was him and they just thought it was some kind of a apparition or something. And they didn't know what to think, but they were afraid. Many times people are afraid of the unknown, the unfamiliar. Let me read it in the Amplified. The sea was getting rough and rising high because a strong wind was blowing. Then, when they had rowed three or four hundred, three or four miles, and were near the center of the sea, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and approaching the boat, and they were terribly frighted. Frightened, but Jesus said to them, "It is I." Do not be afraid. And then they amplified it, said, it is I, and in parentheses, I am. So they equate his claim that it is I as another claim of being the I am, which is the I am is the name of God Almighty. So it is I, I am. Do not be afraid. Uh, it says, then in verse uh, 21, in the KJV, it says, then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land, whither they went. And immediately, well, that's really interesting. Uh, they're four miles out in the middle of the sea. They were, must have rowed for a long time. Let me see if it says anything about how long they rode. And even now, uh, and they entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum, and it was now dark, and Jesus would not come, and the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. So when they had rowed about five and 20 or 30 furlongs, and in the Amplified that says three or four miles, how long does it take a dozen men to row three or four miles. I don't know for sure, but I'm guessing uh, it would probably take quite a while. Like, let me see. If a person can walk a mile in 20 minutes, could they row faster than someone walking? So if it walk a mile in 20 minutes and you row in 20 minutes, then that would be like, an hour or hour and a half maybe um, and then it but then it says here that when jesus entered the boat it says the, the willing received him into the ship and immediately the ship was at, at the land whither they went so you you have really not just the miracle of him walking on the water but another miracle, because when he gets into the boat immediately, they're at their destination. I mean, if they were in the middle of the sea, it should have taken them another three or four hours to to uh, to row the, to the other side. No, I'm sorry, uh, another at least another hour or hour and a half to, to row to the other side. But it says immediately. So you have two miraculous signs, Jesus walking in the water and getting into the boat, and then immediately they're transported uh, three or four miles to the other side. Let me see how it's phrased in the Amplified. 
it says, but you know, then they were willing to take him on board uh, the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore of the land to which they were going. Verse 22 in the KJV says, the day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there save that one where into his disciples entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone, howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias nigh unto the place where they did where they did eat bread. After that the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. So he did this miraculous feeding of the people and they, uh, uh, they're querying, wondering where he is and de decided that they're going to go find him. But let me read it in the Amplified. It says, The next day the crowd that stood on the other side of the sea realized that there had been only one small boat there and that Jesus had not boarded the boat with his disciples, but that Jesus, but, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Now some other small boats from Tiberias had come in near the place where they ate the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they boarded the small boats themselves and came to Capernaum looking for Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? So because of the miracle, I mean, they're puzzled. They can't figure it out. They know that the, the apostles all left in a boat without Jesus. And then, yeah, the, and yet there's no other boats around. And yet Jesus is there with them. So that, of course, brings up the question. Uh, when did you get here? Verse 26 in the KJV says, Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Um, so, uh, I get... I guess Jesus is saying this about them because he knows that he's not going to just make up something. So he knows their hearts, their th innermost thoughts and their real motives. And he knows that they're following him because they just want to keep on being fed. Why can you blame them if they're hungry? Uh, um, but uh, he wants them to be following him because He's performing miracles because he has a message, because he's the promised one, and rather than for the motive of just being, what can I, what am I going to get out of this? I'm, more food, or what else can I get out of this? Um, I'll read that in the Amplified, verse 26. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, you have been searching for me, not because you saw the signs or testing miracles, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not work for food that perishes, but for food that endures and leads to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For God the Father has authorized him and put his seal on him. So he's bringing up this spiritual idea about the food that leads to eternal life rather than the perishable food that just for our mortal bodies. I'll read that in the KJV. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth into everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. So he has something to give them, meat which endures unto everlasting life. 
And then in verse 28, it says, Then they said unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Hmm. This is one of my favorite parts of Scripture. Uh, they, uh, they're, these Jewish people, it's a time where they're very religious and uh, they want to do the works of God. They want to do what God requires of them to please God, to gain approval from God. And it, their religion of Judaism had become legalistic. And they, they thought that salvation would, could be gained through religious efforts, through works. Even though all through the Old Testament, every time we see someone getting saved, it, it's not because of their works, it's because of their faith. Uh, but they're asking him this very important question. This is a question that you might wonder about too. It says, then they said unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? In other words, what, what works does God require of us? Tell us what works you, we need to do. And Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Yeah, who did God send? I and mean, who did God send? The Bible tells us that uh, God sent his, his only begotten son. Uh, yeah. That, that gets us to the the triunity of God. You know, God sends the, the word, the word became flesh, the son of God. God sent his son, and yet, and then we know that the Holy Spirit is also God. So we have three persons, one God, and for several centuries in the early church, they were trying to verbalize it, explain how this is possible. Many times people just kind of gave up. So it's a mystery. But many theologians, the first few centuries, wrote volumes to try to, and, and they argued about how do you explain this triunity? Uh, let me read this in the Amplified. Verse 28 says, Then they asked him, what are we to do so that we may habitually be doing the works of God? Jesus answered, this is the work of God that you believe, adhere to, trust in, rely on, and have faith in the one whom God has sent. Uh, this is very good on the Amplified, the way that they expounded this and amplified the idea of believing. Uh, it says that you believe in the one he has sent, and they inserted that you believe, that is, adhere to, trust in, rely on, have faith in the one whom he has sent. Uh, I have a video titled, Believe Defined. You know, there are people who are very busy today trying to redefine the word believe because about a hundred times in the book of John, it says what you need to do is believe. What do you have to do? What works for you? We well, need to believe. If you believe, you're not condemned. If you don't believe, you are condemned. You know, so, uh, uh, but then people, once they're stuck with this concept that believing is what God wants us, wants from us, well, what does believe mean? Well, it means You've got to surrender your will over to God. You've got to follow him. You've got to serve him. You've got to give up your life and follow him. Pick up your cross and carry him. That, none of that, none of those things are part of the definition of the word believe. Watch my video, Believe Defined, to understand this. But in the Amplified Version, they do a fine job of inserting the meaning, the words that are, are synonymous with the word believe. In this case, it says, this is the work of God that you believe, that is to adhere to, trust in, rely on, and have faith in the one whom he has sent. The one that is sent is Jesus Christ. 
Now, verse 30 in the KJV says, uh, they said therefore unto him, what sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. <laughs> okay. So first of all, Moses didn't give them the bread. It was God that gave them the bread. So that's the first thing that they're missing. They're saying, uh, our, our fathers eat man in the desert, and as it's written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And so Jesus says, Moses did not give you the bread. My father gave you the bread, and, he, and, he, and he, he's giving you true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. So another claim of Jesus, he's referencing himself here. Uh, for the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven. Who came down from heaven? Jesus came down from heaven. He's God. He decides and agrees that he, man needs a savior. Only God can save. So he comes down from heaven, becomes a man. And so Jesus is the one that came down from heaven. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. So Jesus is talking about, for the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. So Jesus says right here, for the bread of God is he. I mean, it goes in one ear and out the other. These people do not understand uh, spiritual things and, and they're stuck thinking of li the literal bread like the manna that God rained down from heaven for the I Israelites to eat and yet Jebus is saying the bread is he bread is a person let me read it in the Amplified um Verse 31 in the Amplified, Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written in Scripture, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. Dense, very dense. It's just amazing how spiritually blind so many of these people are. Nicodemus was blind. The, 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 the uh, Samaritan woman at the well was blind. Jesus spoke in a way where you had to have a spiritual uh, mind to, to understand the things he said. And they immediately try to take things in a worldly perspective instead of a spiritual perspective. So let's go back to the KJV. Then they said unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you, that ye also have seen me, and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. I, want, I love that verse 37. It's an eternal security verse. It's a, it's a verse that denounces uh, Calvinism because it says that if anybody will uh, come to him uh, and him that cometh to me I will no wise cast out so anybody who comes to Jesus will be accepted uh, 
And then he will never cast you away. He will never leave you, forsake you. He, he will remain faithful to you. The Bible says it, it, when we have no faith, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. So he's saying here in verse 37, he will not cast us out if we do will come to him. That's an eternal security verse. Let me read this in the Amplified. He said, uh, Jesus replied to them, I am the bread of life. The one who comes to me will never be hungry, and the one who believes in me as Savior will never be thirsty, for that one will be sustained spiritually. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All that my Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will most certainly not cast out. I will never, never reject anyone who follows me. Well, I don't like that word follow. It's not really part of the, the scriptures. They've inserted or given people a wrong impression that uh, for salvation, it requires discipleship. Discipleship is following Jesus. A disciple is a follower, uh, a student, someone who wants to learn and, and serve. Uh, but a believer is someone who's just trusting Jesus for their salvation. So uh, not all believers are followers or disciples. Uh, not all disciples or followers of Jesus are believers. We have Judas as an example that he was a disciple or even an apostle, and yet he was not a believer. Believer, Jesus said that he's actually the devil. I'll go back to the KJV. Verse 38, for I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will, which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again in, at the last day. And again in verse 40, and this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So we're promised if you, you believe in Jesus, you will have everlasting life and you will be raised up at the last day. The raising up at the last day is a reference to the end times resurrection of the just and the unjust, which I've spoken of before in this study. And so um, this is a, another promise See, when, when, when God makes a promise, it's a guarantee. It's a certainty. We don't have to have any doubts. We don't have to have any worries that he's going to change his mind. The Bible says God cannot break a promise. And so, therefore, uh, you should celebrate that you, salvation is secure. Uh, it cannot be lost. He says that, uh, when you believe on him, you will have everlasting life, and I will raise him up the last day. Let me read it in the Amplified and see how it says it. says it. Now the Jews murmured and found fault with him because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. They kept saying, "Is oops, the wrong verse there. That was verse 42. Um Verse 38 in the Amplified says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I will lose nothing. Uh, but that I give new life and raise it up at the last day. For this is my Father's will and purpose, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him as Savior will have ever will have eternal life, and I will raise him up from the dead on the last day. So the question is the will of the Father. There's a verse that people like to use. Uh, 
that says that uh, you're only saved if you do the will of the Father. And people say, it's, uh, they try to explain that, the, well, the will of the Father is that you follow the commandments and you're obedient and you surrender your life and all these things, all these works. Uh, but the will of the Father is not that we do works. Jesus answered the question when they said, well, what works are the works of God that we should do? And he said, the only thing you're required to do is believe in the Son. So uh, that's the Bible tells us that the will of the Father is for us to believe in the Son. If you want to do the will of the Father, if you want to do good, those who do good get eternal life. Those who do, do not do good do not get eternal life. What do you have to do to do good? There's only one thing, good thing you can do. And that's trust Jesus. Everything else we think that is good, it's like filthy rags in the sight of God, according to the scriptures. Uh, verse 41 in the KJV the Jews then murmured at him because he said I am the bread which came down from heaven and they said is not this Jesus the son of Joseph whose father and mother we know how is it then that he saith I came down from heaven. And Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me. Draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Well, here's another problem verse. It's saying you can't come unless the Father draws you. And a, a Calvinist would say, see, that... that uh, um, not, not the Father is not going to draw everybody, only elect. But there's another verse that we'll probably see here in John, where Jesus said that just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. And he was talking about being lifted up on the cross. And he said, in that manner, I will draw all men to myself. So God is drawing all men. Yeah. If the Father draws you, then it says, uh, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. You can't come to Jesus unless, uh, unless he draws you. And then he says, I'm going to draw all men. So he's drawing you. He's trying to attract you. Will you embrace him? Will you reject him? Will you listen to his drawing? Or will you, or will you, Tune him out. Um, okay, that was verse uh, 44. So let me make a note here. John 6, 45. That's where I'm going to pick up next time. I want to take a couple of minutes now to tell you the good news. The good news the good news is uh, the English translation of the word gospel. So I'm going to tell you the gospel. <laughs> good news. Great news. The greatest news ever. The good news is that salvation and eternal life in heaven is offered to everyone right now with no exceptions. Whosoever. That means any person without exception. Salvation and eternal life in heaven is offered to you right now as a free gift from Jesus. The Bible says, God does not desire that any of us should perish. So God's offering this free gift. Jesus is offering this free gift to every single person. But he's not going to force it on you. It's available if you want to receive the gift. If you don't want to receive it, it's up to you. Heaven, living forever in heaven, in bliss and joy beyond anything we could imagine forever. Do you want it? Well, as I told you, it's a free gift. 
a free gift means that it's given to you without cost to you. You don't have to buy it. In other words, you don't have to pay for it. You don't have to pay for it with contributions to a church or charity. Uh, you don't have to work for it or earn it by being religious, following original religious commandments, following the golden rule, attending church, getting water baptized, repenting of your sins, changing your life, picking up your cross and following Jesus, surrendering your life and serving him. No, those are works in order to earn it. But if it's a free gift, you don't do any of those things. And why? Why don't you have to buy it, pay for it? Because Jesus bought it and paid for it for you. He, he bought it with his own blood and his death on the cross. He paid for our sins as he died on the cross. Uh, work for it? No, you, you don't have to work for it and you can't earn it, no matter how hard you try to work. Because if you wanted to work your way to heaven, the Bible says the standard you have to meet is perfection. The Bible says that we all fall short of the glory of God. So the standard that we must meet is God's glory, which is perfection. And, and you join religions and you get religious and you're working real hard trying to climb this ladder up to heaven. And the harder you work, you're just slipping and slipping. You can't make it. You're not going to reach it because it requires perfection. And for you, it's already too late. You can never be perfect because you've already sinned, just like me. If we've ever sinned once, it's too late for us. We can never be perfect because we have sin on our record. That's why God said man is in a hopeless, helpless situation. He can never be perfect and be with me in heaven. So what are we going to do? Let him be lost? No, we desire that everyone... And no one should perish, but everyone should receive salvation. So we're going to offer it to everybody. What can we do? Well, Jesus became a man. He died on the cross to pay for our sins. He did the works. He lived a perfect life. He never sinned. He performed good works. And all the good things he did, his perfect life, his sinless life, is credited to us. So here's Jesus. Here's you. Your sins went on Jesus. And his good works, his perfection went on you. It's a swap. It's traded places. Isn't that wonderful? Now, how do you know this is all true? Because he died on the cross and he was buried. But scripture says, on the third day, he was raised from the dead. Jesus promised he would raise himself from the dead as a sign to prove He's God and Savior. Uh, and he did it. Uh, he, was, he raised himself bodily from the dead, from the tomb. He, he walked among the people, 500 witnesses, over a 40-day period. They saw him. They talked with him. They touched him. They ate with him. And through that bodily resurrection, he proved he has power over life and death. That's why he raised himself from the dead to give us a sign, proof that he's God and Savior. And it's that resurrection that gives us confidence that our faith in Jesus is justified. So if you want to receive uh, the free gift of salvation from Jesus, you can picture it this way. Jesus wants to pull you up into heaven. He's offering you salvation right now. Just accept him through faith. Embrace him for your salvation. Trust him. Rely on him. Depend on him. Stop trying to get there through some other way like religion or in good works. And instead, trust him instead. And it's, scripture says that he holds us in the palm of his hand. And he says, no one can pluck you out. And he says he will never leave you or forsake you. Even if you somehow get sidetracked and get in sin, even if you lose your faith, even if you get angry and reject God, he will never let you go. 
He will never leave you or forsake you, and he will in no wise cast you out. Isn't that wonderful? That's why when God promises you you're going to heaven because of your faith in Jesus, it's a guarantee. I'm guaranteed I'm going to heaven. How about you? Put your faith in Jesus now and have this blessed assurance of salvation. Thank you for watching. Please join me nightly, 7 p.m. Pacific time. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.